A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this 157th episode of Together for Education webinars brought to you by Notebook. Over 20 months ago, in April 2020, when the pandemic had just set in and schools had closed down, we at Notebook felt it was our duty to set up a platform for educators to connect meaningfully on, discussing problems they were facing with the rising need of digital education and online learning, and arrive at common solutions. Today, 157 episodes later, this platform has grown much bigger than we could have ever anticipated, all thanks to your love and support. We have discussed extremely curricular topics here, like digital learning, NEP and assessments, extracurricular topics like sports and theater, topics like school finance, and even evolved topics like mental health. Success is something that all of us by definition aspire to. The same is true for the numerous schools that are spread across the world. However, for the true measure of success, it is important that we put in place certain metrics that could indicate the degree of success. Like cricket has runs and wickets and business has a bottom line. Today, we seek to develop a better understanding of what parameters determine the degree of success for a school. And more importantly, how schools work towards addressing and achieving those parameters. To discuss this, our first speaker today is Mr. Philip Barrett. Mr. Barrett retired as the deputy headmaster from the illustrious Dune School in Dehradun after 44 years of serving in education across various institutions. Mr. Barrett served the Dune School as housemaster, head of department, dean of activities, dean of student welfare, deputy headmaster, second master, and acting headmaster with great distinction. He also carried out a visioning exercise for the Dune School in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the US. Mr. Barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at Wellington College UK in the year 2000. He's also an athlete, an adventurer, and a naturalist. And we are privileged to have Mr. Barrett as a senior advisor here at Notebook. Sir, thank you so much for making the time to be here today. Over to you. Thank you very much, Abayu. Um, and, and a very good evening to the entire Notebook team uh, in Calcutta and uh, to our very uh, esteemed panelists and to all our guests who've tuned in. Um, you know, I live in the town of Dehradun. Uh, which has some really important institutions uh, like the ONGC, the IMA, the RIMC, uh, the Petroleum Institute, the Survey of India, to mention a few, and also lots of leading residential schools all tucked away in the hills. And when one drives to Dehradun from Delhi, let's say, to the hills, one can see large hoardings and boards all over the place along the road, you know, advertising not only uh, luxury hotels and quaint homestays, but many, of course, malls and departmental stores, but also schools. Lots of schools put up their hoardings, <clears throat> not only for Dehradun, but to Mussoorie, about 35 kilometers away. And what do these hoardings show? They show these beautifully manicured campuses, large 70, 80, 100 acre campuses, and you know, with beautiful photographs, uh, with all the facilities um, and the amenities uh, of course, swimming pools and horse riding seems to feature very high uh, on, on these schools list of what leads to success. The other thing that is always advertised all over Dehradun, in fact, soon after the board exams, is all those little mug shots of all those topper students who got 98 and above percent. And each school trying to, you know, advertise its, you know, the bright lot and uh, outdoing the other. So, you know, I think that a lot of people look at success in terms of the campus, the beautiful campus, and also how well their students do academically. And I also feel that a school or college is very different from an institution. Uh, something that sticks in the minds of people, that has made an indelible mark on society, on the country, even the world, is more an institution. You know, you can't change institutions. Schools you know, they, they may shake and fall, but institutions will weather many changes and they, they, they survive many tremors. <clears throat> and, you know, there are co-ed schools, there are single sex schools, residential schools, variety of schools offering a lot of activities, but very few actually achieve success. And again, it depends on what one defines success to be. One of the things is the school rankings that magazines like Education World and all have come up to. I personally don't think that that is a great yardstick for success because the way they survey, it's only uh, 
it's only um, uh, you know an impressionistic survey along nine to twelve parameters. And these people who survey these schools uh, have hardly visited the schools. They have never visited these schools. It's all by you know hearsay. So one of the things is, <clears throat> and schools that score high on the ranking charts tend to be successful schools. Um, sometimes you know certain names back a school like the Mahendra World College, the Birla Institute of Technology, the Ambani School. Now there's the Adani School. There's a Mercedes Benz School, the Sri Ram Schools, the the DPS franchisee. You know the La Martinias, the Dunes, the Mayos, the Sindhyas, the Shanti Niketan. Why do these institutions stick out? Because they are backed by not only uh, you know lots of corporate money, but they have also um, been around for a very very long time. <clears throat> um, also, you know there are secular and religious institutions that have established themselves over years, over over decades. You know, you have the Hindu College, you have the Aligarh Muslim University, you have Saint Stephen's College, all the Saint Xavier School, the J B Pitted School, which is a Parsi school, the Khalsa Colleges, the Aga Khan Foundations. You know, this again is because it's backed up by very solid institutions. They are looked at as successful institutions, and <clears throat> historically, schools that have been around for a long time. As I said in the opening speech, my school in Pune. Celebrated its centenary in the year I was in school in 1964, so it's now 150 years old. Not far from here, St. George's College in Missouri, that is over 250 years old, and probably the RIMC, known as the Prince of Wales um, Academy, is even older than that. So some schools that have been around for long are looked at as successful institutions. Then, of course, looking at the alumni, the the alumni, you know, like. I've been to a school in America that housed the King of Jordan. It's a beautiful school, and he's developed a school in Jordan based on the exactly the same principles as his school, which is called Deerfield Academy, not far from you know uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Then you know all the Etonian prime ministers. Um, Saint, you know, um, I, I even went to a school called Saint Philip's Exeter, which has more U.S. presidents than any other school in the world. Um, Saint Xavier's have produced so many famous you know politicians. And there's a school in Mount Abu called Saint Mary's that I'm very impressed by. It has produced over and over over the years top army officers, special forces officers who've done great things for the Indian Army. What is it that these schools do that regularly churn out these 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 famous people? <clears throat> College placements are another thing that defines success for a school. Um, some some institutions believe that you know if it's a successful institutions. Your kids will do well and go to a good college. Uh, although, in my personal view, it's, a school is not a place which prepares children for college. I personally feel a school is something that prepares children to discover themselves, to learn and educate themselves, not to get to college. And so, sometimes the career department of the school takes over the whole life of the school because it's something that a school can market. I've sent so many kids to Harvard. I've sent so many kids to Stanford, IIT. In my personal feeling is that that's not a yardstick yet. It is looked at as a yardstick for success. <clears throat> Some schools are extremely creative. You know, uh, I would love to know the, I mean, I know that Nasiruddin Shah went to St. Joseph's Nainital and, and Amitabh Bachchan went to Sherwood. Yeah. So these schools in the hills, which have a lot of drama, a lot of public speaking, um, you know, some schools produce the engineers, the doctor. It is something about these schools that have a tradition that turns out, as I said earlier, famous people in certain you know, walks of life. Um, you know, I also think that you know, it's very hard to judge happiness and contentment. You know, schools that produce happy, good family men, um, it's hard to judge. You, you cannot judge a happy man. You can see how many IIT students are, you know, a school producers, but how can you define and how can you find out how many happy, contented, put together, integrated human beings a school produces? Very hard to say. <clears throat> now, Another school that's gained in popularity very, you know, recently is the day boarding schools, which cater for the needs of the working, you know, two working uh, parents, where the food and the lunch and the homework is all completed in the school, along with the extracurricular activities. And this is actually, these schools are gaining far more leverage than the legacy boarding schools. Uh, and, you know, COVID has, has widened the gap even further. Some schools with their very draconian rules and regulations. Uh, catches the eye. 
Uh, there's a school in the US which I visited, which has no lying, no cheating, no stealing. It's a famous school and it has only 100, 250 students, but nobody lies, cheats and steals. You'll be asked to leave the school. You sign a document when you come in. Now, these are schools that some parents would love. They, they are conservative parents who want to put their girls into a pure girl school uh, and their boys into a you know, boys school. There are more liberal parents who want a co-ed school. You know, there are parents who want a school where there's no uniforms like Woodstock um, up in the hills. Um, some schools enforce very high standards of discipline, no bullying, uh, a certain religious life. Um, so, you know, these, again, lead, once you have a vision and you stick to it, that makes you well known. <clears throat> Again, as I said, schools are defined by their vision and what they aim to do. What sort of students do they wish to produce? Now, I mentioned earlier in one of my webinars, a school called Summerhill in England, whose vision it was to take in only dropouts from other schools and make something of these absolute derelict, junky, drug addict students. And it's amazing to follow what, this, what the alumni of the school did. They became artists, musicians, dancers. They didn't become the prime ministers of England because A.S. Neil, the famous headmaster, even actually went on record to say that he would be very disappointed if his students became the prime minister of England. So they became, they, they were good in the creative field. And they only took dropouts. <clears throat> Again, safety and you know, lovely climate, and beautiful campuses, nothing wrong with it. They also lead to successful schools because safety is a very, very important thing in schools today. Nothing will affect the school more than uh, a lapse in safety, you know, a kidnapping or brutality of any sort or any sort of child abuse. It would affect the school more than having 10 failures. So safety is something that really would make a school very famous. Again, sports, as Eshabayu mentioned, you know, there are some schools like Oakham that produced, uh, you know, uh, broad, uh, our man, uh, <clears throat> uh, can't get his first name, the fast bowler. This is a school in Delhi that produced both Ajay Jadeja and Murli Kathir. Now, a school that produces two test players in the same team at the same time, there's something that they're doing right. Don Bosco's in Bombay produced Shastri and a number of sports. And of course, in the Dune School, we have Abhinav Bindra, who, who got a gold medal for India. However, I must go on record to say that Abhinav Bindra didn't finish from Dune. He, um, we, a lot of people use him, but he left school when he was a very junior boy. <clears throat> so sometimes schools are, you know, they, they turn out and produce famous people. Um, again, you know, sometimes the faculty of the school, it's hard to judge. There are certain very famous headmasters and principals of school. And uh, the school becomes famous because of these larger than life figures who, and you know, a lot of these boarding schools have this, uh, have these larger than life, uh, idiosyncratic, um, you know, crazy people and kids love them and parents want their kids to be around these sort of people. <clears throat> Again, you know, sometimes uh, what, what I get impressed by is total quality management. How does a school treat its visitors? How do its children wish visitors? Um, I know of a story where uh, somebody came to look at the school I worked in and uh, I had two of my boys in my house, show them around. And at the end of one hour walking around the campus, these parents came back to me and said, we want our son in this school. So I said, why, what, what, what impressed you? Was the swimming pool good? Was the gymnasium good? He says, no, the way these two boys spoke to us. So sometimes just being kind and the way you treat your guests makes a school famous. Adventure is a big thing. Some parents want adventure, like Timber Tops in Australia, famous Prince Charles went there, Atlantic College, Wales, Gordonston School, Scotland. These people have produced mountain climbers, you know, intrepid, you know, uh, you know safety, rescue people. Uh, <clears throat> some schools are famous for people who have gone on to invent things, you know. I would love to send my kid to Elon, Elon Musk's school, Sundar Pachai's school, Dr. Christian Bernard. These are schools that, that produce such uh, big names are obviously um, in, in the limelight. I know a school that I did a little work in, in Bangalore that produced the famous major Uni Krishna who was posthumously awarded because he gave up his life uh, in the siege of the Ta Taj Hotel in 2611. You know, that school is obviously doing something that produced major Oni Krishna. <clears throat> Some schools are very, again, I say very, very um, niche market. They, they are famous for um, just their USP for the drama, debates, um, you know, the extracurriculars that make school famous. 
Um, <clears throat> also, you know, yet after all I've said, um, there are schools that are doing their thing very quietly in an unknown manner, unknown to all, out of the league tables, you know, on education world. Yet they're doing wonderful things. They're doing wonderful things and making the world a better place. How do you get to know these schools? These are also famous schools. Now, <clears throat> schools that keep pace with the future, um, are, which are doing what the best schools in the world are doing, which are always changing, which are always keeping ahead of the, the, of the curve. Uh, these are schools that are going to be um, very, very famous. Uh, schools that are digitally endowed, blended learning, their spare time activities, not philately, but 3D printing. Um, they may have gone into the international baccalaureate or the IGCSE, I don't know. Uh, not to say that the IS, ISC and the, and the uh, CBSC are, are not good, but they will have to up their, <coughs> pardon me, they will have to up their um, game if they have to become, you know, stay in the, in, the, in the big league because the international school are going to take over. In the future, successful, uh, <coughs> in the future, successful schools are going to be online schools. Um, certainly the blended learning school is important where every kid has a laptop, there's 24 seven connectivity, uh, Kindles in place of library, swipe cards for the library, tuck shop attendance, school store, modernized schools, schools that don't just rest on their laurels. And uh, you know, there's so many residential schools that are doing the same thing that they did 150 years ago, but some schools are changing and keeping pace with the times. Now, in my view, a great, and successful school doesn't have to advertise itself. Its students are happy, holistic people who have found their niche and are, have a circle of friends, are paying their taxes, they're ethical citizens, they raise happy families, they are creative, assertive, socially conscious. Um, a successful student is the school's best advertisement. And, um, and the number of schools that are producing these wonderful kids for going around there and changing the world. Finally, Another yardstick for success is how a school is led. I mean, right from the societies of the boards that run them, the principal, the staff, not only the teaching staff, the administrative and support staff, how are these people led? What is good leadership? Are they happy? <clears throat> Do they leave school? Is there a high uh, attrition rate? Do the principals change every year or do they stay? Do you have a stable staff, a stable, happy staff? People don't understand. Teachers might do a B.Ed. or an M.Ed. and he might have a wonderful staff, but if they're not led by an able principal who may not be a great teacher, but he's a great team builder, these schools sometimes are very happy and effectively uh, run places. I hope this is, um, puts the, I guess the ball rolling. I look, very, I, I look forward to hearing from Achin and our esteemed panelists. Thank you very much and over to you, Shabai. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction to this topic. That was an extremely comprehensive list of all the parameters, both process oriented as well as result oriented, that could lead to a successful school being perceived so. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker, as sir mentioned, is Ochin Bhattacharya. Ochin is the founder and CEO at Notebook. A chartered accountant by training, Ochin was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. Ochin has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE. PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. He is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, a fellow of the ICAI, and a member of CPA Australia and CPA Ireland. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. Ochin is an avid reader and a passionate traveler with keen interests in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He is a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce, and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies. Just for a minute before I welcome Ochin to speak, I am currently experiencing terrible network outages, so I apologize in advance if my network acts up. Well, Ochin, the stage is all yours. Over to you. Good evening, everyone. Shubha, am I audible? Yes, loud and clear. I once again welcome all of you to today's session. So I think we have a very uh, interesting and insightful topic at hand. 
And when we discuss about institutional success and the way it has been viewed at by stakeholders of the educational ecosystem around the world. So there are various ways of looking at it. I was, uh, I was uh, yesterday while going to the topic, I was reading about uh, the entire uh, in the evolution of the American education system, higher education system. So I tried to share uh, some of my observations regarding the same, not necessarily from a K-12 perspective, but more from an overall uh, educational ecosystem, the more holistic uh, and global uh, perspective. Post that, of course, we have a wonderful panel here today. I think Bharatsa gave us a great start. And I also look forward to hear from the panel. So a few things from my side, like uh, ever since it declared itself arbiter of uh, college excellence almost uh, four decades back. So there's an organization called uh, US News and World Report, which, which basically ranks schools, schools in US based on measures of uh, wealth, fame, and exclusivity. And needless to mention, in US parallels, when we discuss about schools, so naturally institutions of uh, you know, higher education, naturally they come in. The surprising part is when the latest list was recently published, it featured a new metric, social mobility defined by the magazine as how well schools succeed at enrolling and graduating students from low income families. Now this is the latest addition because, and, and why this is a big deal? Because magazine's rankings from the start, from, from, the, from the you know, first year itself, reflected the opposite values by focusing on factors like, like uh, uh, SAT scores, spending per student, alumni giving, surveys of uh, peer institutional leaders, rankings have long created incentives for, for, for college presidents eager for better US news scores to raise prices, compete for status, and market themselves to the children of the affluent. So this is a complete departure, complete change of stand. Because in this way, US news, has been both a driver and validator of an increasingly elitist and dysfunctional American higher education system, which first began, of course, in, 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 in a long back 1862, when President Abraham Lincoln signed the Morrill Act, creating the land grant college system. Because until then, most, most US colleges taught classical languages and Bible to blooding clergymen and the sons of the prosperous. This particular act called Morrill Act gave millions of acres of federal land to states to develop or sell for the building of universities, which would basically promote liberal and practical education of the industrial classes. The study of subjects like agriculture, mechanical sciences. So this basically led to founding and expansion of such universities like University of Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, Ohio, etc. The sec again, these are the first wave. The second wave began after World War II, second wave of reform, when US Congress passed the GI Bill. To leaders of you know, many, many colleges, initially, uh, they, they feared that the prospect of hordes of former soldiers descending to their institutions. So that was, that was one apprehension that, you know, uh, this will basically create intellectual hobo jungles. But the legislation proved to be a huge success. It provided millions of returning war veterans with college education and helped create the world's first mass middle class. And the second wave continued and continued with the, with the, with the Higher Education Facilities Act, which was passed in 1963, which funded the expansion of campuses. But today, if you look at institutional success, you look at how, how it has evolved. And in the various parameters and metrics, we see a complete change of stand. Because when we're referring to this, this, this evaluation, 
you see that initially the thought process was quite different however in recent decades and and again since i was discussing about the the the, the american system in recent decades expectations of higher education have shifted in us because of changes in the economy a post secondary credential has gone from something every american ought to have in order to pursue something to something which every american need to pursue it is no longer optional it's mandatory it's basic to have a shot at the middle class now again we discussed about first wave of reform we discussed about second wave of reform now there is pressure for a third wave of reform and we see it increasing with rising college enrollment figures especially among low income students and this is why today when we look at this rankings we see new metrics has come in when in social mobility so an institutional success is also by being defined by how much it is being able to empower students from the aspirational class how much it is being able to help and handhold students in terms of their social mobility students who come from a privileged background with multiple layers of support anyways many of them with 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 all kinds of support and resources at their hand are doing fairly well but the matrix now is, is an institution being able to help those who really need it the most so when when we discuss about an institution's evaluation i guess there are various various uh, parameters and first and foremost of course is what is what is the mission of the institution because and also how how effective is it is it only in letter or also in spirit because it basically demonstrates strong commitment and also it's very important that uh, not only having a statement of mission which which basically uh, which basically defines institution's broad purpose but also i think it's equally important that each and every member of the team each and every person on the campus believe in it and also the fact that is it being is it being periodically evaluated reviewed are we making necessary changes do you think in today's age on learning is a bigger bigger challenge the learning and unless until we are flexible enough to unlearn to take a complete fresh look at things blue sky thinking it's very difficult to be successful second of course uh, student learning programs and services that the core core purpose for which an institution exists facilities in terms of student learning you know uh, extra curricular library the entire infrastructure of course and third i think the other factor which is very important uh, to 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 have a very fair measure of an institutional success is also to see how effectively the institution is being able to utilize resources at its disposal because every institution quite logically will not have access to equal amount of resources and when i say resources uh, be it human resource physical resource technological resource financial resource but i think measure of success is that how effectively an institution is being able to utilize them to achieve its broad purpose so whether it be student learning outcome whether it be continuous improvement whether that be you know continuous learning activities of faculty teachers you know, the whole the whole gamut the other of course i think birds have very briefly mentioned i think very very important aspect is leadership leadership and governance there is no doubt about it. it it is really important because this entire entire decision making process the vision of the leader it is very important to have someone who is a visionary who exactly knows what he or she wants and i think the contribution of a head of institution is is second to none and any institution so many esteemed senior educators we have in this forum who are heading their own institutions their contribution to the cause is is tremendous because at at, at some point of time i think the vision of a leader plays a very big role now the other aspect is uh, i think we we discussed about uh, we discussed about uh, 
changing parameters. We discussed about importance of social mobility. We discussed about a few basic parameters based on which you can very broadly, of course, this is a huge topic. There, there may be various other ways of looking at it. I think the other aspect is, uh, I think when we discuss about an educational institution, especially about higher education, I think birds are very, very beautifully put it that the purpose of school is not necessary to prepare students for college. And I completely agree with him. A hundred percent, sir. Now coming to uh, the next step, as far as institutions of higher education are concerned, I think it's not just about jobs. Colleges must actually help students find their passion. And I think when we discuss about an institutional's and institution's success, I think up to a very large extent, this is one factor. I was reading about a recent lecture in, uh, uh, in uh, Trinity College, a course on American uh, higher education. And a professor asked his students, why do you go to college? And the most common answer was to get a job. No one mentioned, no one mentioned that going to college, I think they want to go to college also to explore their purpose or to embark on a meaningful life. Very surprising because each year with millions of graduates who are, who, are, who are starting their careers. And unfortunately, many of them who are, who at some point of time after a few years feel unhappy and unfulfilled because they suffer from a crisis of meaning. I was reading uh, uh, some work of uh, author William Damon and his, his book, uh, uh, I think a very nice book, The Path to Purpose and how young people find their calling in life. And the author opines that 31 million people between the ages of 44 and 70 want an encore career. They have not found fulfillment in their chosen job and want to find something that provides greater meaning and impact. So it's very clear. Another author, and another very important, very uh, relevant book in this regard, The Power of Meaning, Creating a Life That Matters. It says that 70% of all employees, 70% of all employees are dissatisfied with their jobs and actively disengaged with their work. Now for decades, colleges and universities have approached career preparation in the same way. They provide job search tools, networking advice, resume consulting, but higher education's approach to helping students plan for their future must change because the landscape that graduates inherit has already changed. This shows that today's students may have around 10 jobs by the time they're around 40 years old, 10 jobs. That's shocking, right? Stanford professor, uh, two Stanford professors, they wrote a book called Designing Your Life, which says that 27% of college, college graduates in US are not working in their field of studies. Sorry, only 27% are working in their field of studies, only 27%. That means 73% of college graduates are not working in their field of major, in their field of specialization. That's huge. And we have seen the same example in our own country. We have seen students completing their engineering from, from various disciplines. But at the end of the day, we see 75, 80% of those engineering graduates choosing a career in IT. Nothing wrong with it. But then today, if you look at the numbers, we realize that it, it is that important. And I think up to a very large extent, an institutional success is also defined. That is it being able to help students to make thoughtful decisions about the trajectory of their lives and empower them with the resources to do that? Because studies show that the current generation of students care deeply about purpose, meaning, and happiness at work. Because it's very important. Very often they ask this question, is my work meaningful to me? Do I have a cause? 
do I have influence, purpose, or alignment? Now, if higher education does not <clears throat> teach students how to explore these issues at 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 a at a college level, at a university level, then students will graduate with a with a disadvantage. So, I think helping students in this regard is is a very important, uh, very very important role. There's no doubt about it. Even 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 if you look at things from an employer's perspective, even employers are taking note. of this generation's interest in finding their meaningful work and making changes accordingly the the, the employers major co corporates around the world they are actually changing their own organization culture to keep pace very uh, famous book called uh, conscious capitalism authored by uh, john mackey and raj sisodia highlight companies including whole food market google starbucks twitter deloitte pepsi and our very own tata group that have fundamentally transformed their culture to focus on doing work for the greater good because they have noted that business has a much broader positive impact on the world when it is based on a higher purpose so purpose basically is the reason why 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 the company exists now a company in sense of higher purpose definitely creates an extraordinary degree of engagement now the question is today when 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 corporates are recognizing this today when students are very clear that they want to be meaningfully engaged so it's no longer important to uh, to be able to earn your uh, bread and butter it, it's important to earn it in a meaningful way in a socially responsible way by doing something which you actually enjoy by doing something where you feel that you are contributing to this world after a hard day of work when you go to bed you are happy with the fact that yes you are contributing towards the planet now so considering this that the students are very clear the corporates are very clear educational institutions who are basically preparing students for their life for their career they have a huge role in this particular regard not only to make students job ready but actually help them handhold them guide them to know themselves to be to be able to self introspect to come to terms with their strength and development needs so they actually know and understand that okay this is the path that i should embark upon this is the uh, first we went to uh, the the other aspect which is uh, very important uh, which we discuss now but i think the last aspect is you know culture what makes a good school culture and a culture will be will be strong or weak depending on the interaction between people in the organization in a strong culture there are many overlapping and 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 cohesive interactions so that knowledge about the organization's distinct character and what it takes to thrive in it is widely spread now culture i i believe there are various interwoven elements which basically shape culture and each of these have the power to influence culture in their own way be it of uh, fundamental beliefs and assumptions things that people at your school consider to be true they believe in it shared values very important norms how how members believe that they should act patterns and behavior on the way people actually act and behave and of course last tangible evidence be it physical visual auditory with regard to behavior of people in school and i think culture also is is, is very important and up to a very large extent because it's very easy to look at quantitative metrics it's very easy to look at grades and scores but the softer factors which are important for life for example the kind of values that students inculcate i think these are equally important if not more so these are few things that uh, i i wanted to share i thank all of you for giving me a very patient hearing we have a wonderful panel here today very very experienced panel of senior educators and i'm sure they they come in with their own wealth of experience decades of experience and i really am i'm very eager to hear from them their perspective 
on this wonderful topic. I thank all of you again. Over to you, Shubhai. Thank you, Ochit. Thank you for that wonderful presentation and taking us through some of the most important aspects that determine the success of any educational institution. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as Ochin mentioned, we have a fantastic panel lined up for you. But before I introduce the panel, just a minute to tell you about Notebook. We at Notebook are an edtech platform. We create short videos pertaining to the K-12 school syllabus. What this means is for every subject and every topic, you would find relevant videos on the Net Notebook platform. Now, these videos come in handy in two cases. One is when you as a teacher want to introduce a topic to your students. You can play these short videos, which are just about six to 10 minutes in duration before you start a class that gives your students a visual grasp of the topic that you're about to teach. The second use case for these videos is when the student is studying at home. They have access to these same videos on their personal devices, be it a smartphone or a laptop or any other connected device. They can watch these videos from home and they can watch them over and over again until they get a very clear understanding of the topic that you had taught. I'm going to now play a short mashup of some of the notebook videos before we go on to the discussion that we have today. Namaste, bachon. Notebook mein aapka swagat hai. Is nai video ko aapke saamne prasthut karte huye hume behat khushi ho rahi hai. Hamara udyesh hai parampara ka siksha ko adhunik tarike se pesh karna. Taki hamari ye nai pirdhi ya aap sabhi kahi bhi kabhi bhi isse aasani se pad sakein. This tale is about a kingdom where the king and minister were idiots and used to run the province in their own foolish way. This was the kingdom of fools, where everyone woke up at night and slept during the day as per the weird royal orders. One day, a guru and his disciple visited this unusual place and were surprised by the rules and regulations followed within the territory. Apni इन पंक्तियों में कवि समाज के सभी स्तर के मनुष्यों के बीच संबंध स्थापित करते हैं जो कि मानवता की सबसे पहली सीढ़ी है लेट अस ट्राई टू लर्न मोर अबाउट दिस बाय एक्सप्लोरिंग थ्री सिचुएशंस फर्स्ट दैट मे अराइज बिटवीन एनी स्ट्रेट लाइन एंड अ सर्कल द फर्स्ट सिचुएशन इज वन वेयर द सर्कल एंड लाइन नेवर इंटरसेक्ट ईच अदर वी ऑब्जर्व दैट बोथ द लाइन एंड द सर्कल डू नॉट टच और इंटरसेक्ट ईच अदर there can be no consistent geometrical inference from such a situation the second situation arises when the circle and the line intersect each other at exactly two points hame ummeed hai ki pariksha mein puche jaane par ab aap bahut prabhavi chitra varnan karne mein saksham honge is paath mein itna hi The king Louis the 16th had come to power in 1774 at only 20 years of age. The king helped the 13 American colonies gain independence from Britain. Aaj hum ek kahani do bailon ki katha padhne wale hain. Is kahani mein kai samajik sandesh nahit hain jo hum sabhi ke jeevan se gehre had tak jude hain. Notebook mein aap sabhi ka punh swagat hai. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was a short mashup of some of the notebook videos. If you head over to our website www.notebook.school, or visit our Android or iOS apps, you would find more than ten thousand such videos at your disposal. Well, with that done, it is now time to introduce the wonderful panel that we have with us today. We have with us today Miss Preeti Malhotra, who was brought up in Kolkata as a student of Saint Thomas School. She then went on to finish her MSc from Presidency College and an MEd from Vidya Peet Varanasi. She has a teaching experience spanning across 32 years and experience as principal in CBSE schools for over 8 years. She works in a group A school and her journey from being a local teacher to a principal has been a great journey of learning and teaching. She has worked as an observer in various competitive exams and gotten the best teacher award four times during her career. She's also gotten the best attention award for over 7 times. She got various certificates in a number of educational workshops. Ma'am, thank you so much for being here today. It's a privilege to have you on the panel. We also have with us 
Ms. Aradhana Rana, who is a gold medalist from Delhi University and a postgraduate in nutrition with a bachelor's degree in education. With 40 years of teaching and administrative experience behind her, she started the Icon Public School at Ahmednagar in 2008, which is now a senior secondary CBSC school of great repute. Besides being the founder, principal, and the director of the Icon Public School, she's a trainer for soft skills and personality development. She's also a parenting coach and a member of WICCI. She's the recipient of many awards and honors in the field of education, including the Sanjeevani Seed of Knowledge Award, Leading Educationist of the Year Award, Pride of Knowledge Award, and Mother Teresa Foundation Award for Contribution to Education and Social Welfare. She's a published author of several books on communication skills and spoken English. Her latest books are Correctly Speaking for College-Going Students and Professionals and Master English, a series of eight books for school-going students of classes one to eight. She's a motivational speaker and a life skills coach. Her interests are in music, art, poetry, and literature, and she's ever ready to learn new skills. She's also an ardent traveler and a travel blogger. But above all, she's an educator with a mission to bring in innovation in education to make it effective and realistic and believes in a system that will keep up with progressive thought and lead the new generation towards developing life skills. She believes in the maxim, life is not counted in the years you spend on this earth, but in the number of lives you touch in a lifetime. Ma'am, thank you so much for making the time to be here today. It's a privilege to have you here. We also have with us Dr. Gangadhar Pai, who is the principal of Sri BMK Public School in Kurugodu in Karnataka. He has over 22 years of experience in the field of education. He has trained the teachers of primary and secondary school on the topic professional development program and 21st century skills of Kalyana Karnataka region. He was honored with the Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan Rashtriya Shikshartan Samman in 2021. He played the role of a guest speaker at the IDY MPA's first national conference on the topic good health and well being. He was awarded with Guruvarya Samman 2021 by HETS and attended the Education Growth Summit organized by TEDx in association with Allen Carrier Institute. He has achieved 100% result in AISSE class 10 examination as a principal between 2017 and 2019. He has worked as a center superintendent for AISSE grade 10 examinations of the CBSC. He has also worked to get the examination center of AISSE 10 standard CBSC. As a principal, he successfully organized Cluster 8 CBSC Coco Tournament and the NKCS Sahodaya Sports Event. Sir, thank you so much for being here today. It's a privilege to have you on the platform. I shall stop my share now and start my video. Once again, my apologies if my video gets stuck because I'm facing terrible network outages today. Uh, a very good evening and thank you so much to all of you for being here today. Uh, Ms. Merotra, if I may come to you first, ma'am. Uh, the topic that we are discussing today, we are trying to assess what constitutes a successful school. So, ma'am, in your opinion, in you, your uh, personal experience, what are those parameters that, to your mind, make a school successful? Very good evening to everyone. The main motto of teacher is to build tomorrow's future. We are the future's builders. Now, one thing I would like to first tell that during this three years, that is 2020, 2021, and 2022, we teachers were the best students too, because we learned the new activities, the new procedures, and the new way to teach the students. We were the best students, I think, every educators connected to education centers were the best student before they were the best teachers. Now, we learned many things, many, many things. Some happily, some maybe very sadly, but yes, but yet we did learn. The main motto to build a future is not only studies, is not only that we aim them to become a good engineer, a good doctor, or a good any XYZ, but we have to teach them firstly how to become a good human being that we are shortage nowadays in India or if we talk about India itself. Whenever we uh, compare education, why do we compare only with A group school? What will the students or the people 
who do not who cannot give their students to a group school what will they do in this world we have to think about them also because remember i told in the uh, first line we are the builders of future so we have to think about those students and parents who are not capable to afford or to go to a group a group school we have to also think about students why to give only prizes first rank grades only to the first few students of the class why cannot we promote the students who are bad benchers who are middle people students sitting in the class why cannot we bring them to the first rank we can get the credit as a good teacher only when we bring the last bencher to the front bench by their own choice not by our force not by our punishment not by our thought we have to bring them by uh, when the students think or improve themselves one thing which i think in the education point of view that we have to bring our parents also parallel effective as we are bringing the students they, naturally they have another part of role to be played for the uh, for their child we also have another part of role to be played but for the future of the child we both have to be together to build the future of the child that is my thought every child cannot become a doctor every child cannot become an engineer but every child can become a good human being if a child knows how to draw an apple can't we teach or evaluate them to draw a apple in a plate or can't he we uh, can't he learn by himself how to draw a basket of fruits now it is now it is our duty as a teacher that we should motivate the child that how he can jump from a apple to a basket of fruits we have to guide them it is not only if we tell them that see you draw a line like this and that and then you can draw but we have to show them show them practically that means we have to guide them practically we at this age when we can learn something difficult what we have learned during 2020 i think so we can teach more better than what we have learned all these years the main motto which i would like to express that we should not think that stood that school is the only place where we can guide them to bring first rank 90% or 80% with studies we know that in today's education it is that uh, we are not teaching the students in the school what they have to run in their life okay now for example if we are driving a car what is the ness what is so important to drive a car i don't think so we need a driving teacher i don't think so we need a science teacher it is just the experiment what we have to do is to make our hands perfect okay so that practical thing we have to make the students also do so that we can get the right contact to bring them up the feedback which we gave the par the parents about the child is not only the report card that contains the child's a grade b grade or c grade we have to confirm that that the feedback that how we can uh, uh, we have to parameter a child according to, to their standard it is not only with study with other activities also which may come in front of them in future we have seen so many so many casualties going down during this pandemic era which we went now why did it happen maybe one way what is my point of view they did not have the capacity to fight themselves that is why if we can come in this age and learn things why cannot do it could find another way to run their loving and uh, their living 
so we have to teach these things to the students also from the very beginning that tomorrow is not difficult if you make your today available at every corner of this uh, of the world money it means that you have to have two three part learn in front of you very properly before you start your life schooling means does not mean only grade a grade b grade it does not mean only grade it also means how we interact with them how we take achieve the academic along with the activities which will help them to run their life in future it is not only what we teach them cat cat we can also teach them at or eat as okay now this is it depends on us i always say that we teachers if we can build the future build the future why cannot we improve ourselves to improve their standard much better than what we did these two uh, three years have taught us many many things when we were student we did not have computer we did not have smartphone okay technology has changed but we have also changed with the technology that is we had the inner spirit within us that we could learn this this learning method should be should be inside the student throughout the life we have to make them as a sport in the life that whatever comes in front of you with education you have to see that you know many more things just before we started this just as we started this seminar today workshop today uh, mr philip said that two people were praised when a guardian came inside where uh, to visit the school i think so you all must have heard this view also what was the reason behind it that those two people were gentlemen uh, with uh, with the teacher being a teacher they were also gentlemen because they knew how to behave how to talk how to learn or how to speak we how we very soon get hypered tensed uh, depressed these should not be in students life we have to teach them from the very beginning we should not say that life will teach them no sir i believe that we should teach them thank you everyone for listening to me very politely thank you so much thank you so much ma'am i think those points about uh, making the school inclusive creating better human beings and the value system that you spoke about are wonderful ways to measure the success of a particular school aradhana ma'am can i may come to you next ma'am you are the director of a school uh, i'm sure you are ensuring a lot of these parameters for your school uh, where do you rank the importance of the school ratings that bharat sir spoke of earlier Thank you. Hello. 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 Yes, ma'am. Um, Shubhayu, are you there? Okay, ma. Uh, we'll come to Preeti Aradhana, ma'am. Now, hello. Hello. Yeah, ma'am. So uh, we will start with you. The next question uh, for you: Like, what are the most important parameters to you when you assess the success of your school, ma'am? If you can deliver it. Ah, uh, thank you so much. First of all, I must uh, you know congratulate you for the uh, Mr. Philip. I think um, uh, when he started off, he laid down a lot of parameters, and uh, most of them were very very relevant. And uh, I would just like to add to what he said. Uh, in fact, uh, he uh, he practically said everything about what uh, a successful school is about. but then since his experience has been in uh, most of the top schools uh, in the country and outside so i would like to touch upon you know schools uh, in say b grade or c grade cities and uh, come to success of these schools 
you know, ranking institutions cannot be a measure of the success of a school because schools are so, so different. Like uh, Ms. Merotra also said, you cannot compare, you know, one school to another because of different circumstances and different clientele. So uh, coming to that, uh, uh, success of a school cannot be measured these days with anything uh, for that matter, because, you know, when, when you take children, any school that uh, sifts out uh, its, its, uh, its intake, how can you measure success? I mean, uh, these uh, top class schools, look at the admission procedures, look at how children are admitted to top class colleges. Uh, uh, Mr. Bhattacharya talked about institutions and colleges. I mean, when you take a child who's got 100%, or in school, when you take a child who knows practically everything, then you interview his parents and you ensure that this, you know, parents can uh, make him do the rest. Where is the school coming in? So my contention is always that uh, the success of a school uh, is described uh, by what improvement the school brings about in a child under its care. When a child enters, like I would talk to my school, we do not have admission tests and we do not have any criteria on which a child is taken into the school because it's our responsibility. You know, once the child enters my school, it's his, my responsibility. I jolly will make sure that he does something in life. So from that point of view, um, I have very great objections to school, uh, you know, schools which uh, have this very, very stringent criteria of taking a child. A child is a child. When he comes in, especially in the first, first one or two years, I mean, after that, you, can, you could say probably the child lacks the foundation to cope up. Uh, you could make a hundred excuses. But when a child enters your school in class one, how can you measure your success when you take in a child who knows practically everything, goes through three stringent tests, two interviews, and the parents go through an interview, and after that you say, oh, the child is uh, you know, good enough to come to my school. Any child is good enough to come to my school. I take care that after that, I am responsible for the child's future. So that defines the success of a school. First of all, like everybody said, effective leadership is a must. Again, uh, you know, a lot of schools have this concept of uh, effective uh, leadership that you sit in a you know, glass cage. Uh, when, when the leader is unapproachable, it's not effective uh, leadership. A leader uh, uh, should be approachable to the staff, to the parents, to the children. A child must be able to walk into a principal's or director's office and talk. I mean, that's the confidence we give our children. Anytime, just walk up and say what you have to say. So effective leadership is a must, no, no two uh, ways about it. Secondly, the success of an institution depends on the expectations you have from your staff and your children. Uh, I've, I've heard, uh, you know, people say a lot of times participating is the spirit and it doesn't matter when you, where you win or lose. No, I mean, unless you expect your children to be the best, how will they ever compete? So uh, it's not about giving them tensions, it's not about giving them stress, but your expectations of your staff and the students must be high enough for them to why to reach your expectations. And that is where uh, you are successful. Uh, thirdly, uh, evaluation. We evaluate at the end of the year. And, uh, you know, like uh, Mr. Phillips said, you have hoardings and, you know, everybody's advertising. So many uh, children got through this college, competitive exams, this, that. Now tell me um, again, uh, what is the credit we are taking for the, you know, from the school? Half the children are going for tuitions, the other half are going to academies in the 11th and 12th. They're going to all kinds of academies which have no bearing on their personality. So, I mean, at the end of it, nothing succeeds like success. When a child gets to IIT, everybody wants to pop the credit. The school say it's our child, the academy is our child. The Parents say it was because of our sacrifices. The student says it was because of my hard work. So ultimately, um, this is again not a criteria for uh, for the success of a school, because at the end of it, when you're uh, you're saying you know in holdings that this child belongs to us, but there are you know um, uh, to every child you put on the holding, there are fifteen more who do nothing. So just because they can, don't come on the holding, they they are not your friend. 
It's not, it's not like that. The success doesn't belong to you. The success of a school cannot belong to any school which, uh, which evaluates a child on the basis of marks because any child can learn, wrote, study day and night, go through academies and achieve. Next, the uh, educational institutions, they say that uh, you know the, they are successful because they have this particular syllabus, and uh, you know they have the IT syllabus, they have the international syllabus. Again, uh, it's not the syllabus that counts because no matter what you do, ultimately it is the citizens you produce. It is not. Uh, you know, so much uh, of maybe you can, you know, use a few names, a, ch a, a school produce, produced a, a, a sports person, a, a film star, or whatever. But these are only a handful. It's the culture of the school where children are compassionate, where children are disciplined, where children have regard for social values, for ethical values. So to me, success would be if I see my child outside school, where there is no monitoring of the classes, say I go and attend a wedding and I see my children there and they stand out in that crowd. This child who belongs to the Icon Public School does not throw wrappers all around. This child who belongs to my school will wish everybody and will be polite to everybody. This child, when he sees a member of staff or somebody or anybody he recognizes, will come and wish, will come and you know make a, a small talk. So this is, to me, this is the success of my school, and uh, not the criteria that we just did. Uh, again, another very nice criteria of uh, determining success is how fast a school adapts to change. You know, uh, the definition of intelligence is, uh, I think the best definition I have come across uh, for intelligence is uh, adapting to your environment. So whether it is an animal, an insect, a human being, or anybody, your intelligence is how you adapt to your environment. And like uh, Ms. Malhotra, Merotra said, uh, the pandemic has taught us a lot of things, which are the schools who adapted well beautifully and quickly, those are successful schools. You know, the, the moment we found a situation that, uh, that was just beyond any imagination, none of us had experienced it, how the staff got into it, how they adapted measures the success. A very successful school is one where you respect diversity. So uh, any school which is uh, uh, which is prohibited, which where you know you they they uh, contain the kind of children, whether it's on religious grounds, whether it's it's on social grounds, uh, whether it's on economical grounds, they are not inclusive. It how can you be successful in a society where you do not uh, welcome anybody from any environment? So any school that has a diverse or mixed kind of uh, uh, clientele uh, is uh, walking on the path to success. Uh, again, a school is success uh, successful if it has a wonderful governance, honest, ethical, transparent. You'll see a lot of schools where all sorts of underhand things are done. How can a school be successful when your role models are like this? So anything has to be taught by example. I visited, you know, this. Uh, there is uh, uh, this uh, uh, village near us. Uh, it's Anna Hazare's village called Ralegao City. So I, uh, you know, when I was teaching, I had taken my students there to see the village. There was, when we entered, I mean, we, uh, it was a challenge for us to have you know, classroom discipline. All the time as teachers, we were, you know, students don't be quiet, they don't sit, they don't, you know, listen. And here we went to the school, students were bare feet, students had, didn't have a, a decent shirt on their back. In the class, the city, and we had gone unannounced, not that they were ready for an inspection. It was better than any inspection I had in your school. They were so disciplined and all of them were listening intently to this teacher who was to our snobbish minds. He was uh, like nothing we would have taken in our school. And the, and the uh, students were glued to whatever he was saying. And then somebody told us, you know who these students are? They are delinquents. 
We catch hold of them from villages where parents cannot manage them. We bring them to this. And these are the students who, you know, some of them had attained academic heights beyond what was expected. Some of them were making good on lives. So, uh, and they went out into the world to earn a, a, a living, which was hard earned. So this to me was the biggest success, more than any school would boast of. Because when you take children from this section of society and you make them into this, this is success. So, you know, a measure of success cannot be uh, on who funds the school, on who uh, the school or how you know what kind of snob value is attached to it uh, it has to be on the good human beings you produce to make a meaningful society anytime we produce students who do not contribute to the community we are failures because the, unless the community rises none of us can rise we are not successful educators unless we produce uh, you know, good people who come into society to work for the society. A good school also has a lot of parent participation. Like I always say, it's very easy to teach the students. This is the easiest part of running a school is to the students to have them you know, do academically well, even otherwise culturally, socially, sports, everything we do. The biggest challenge is to deal with parents because parents have very hard set you know uh, values and they have very hard set beliefs uh, they have been brought up in a, a certain way and these days somehow um, the uh, the wealth speaks so when they come to school it's about we paid the fees so i mean you are at your beck and call. So to get that mindset, uh, you know, clear is a big challenge. So successful uh, institution is one who encompasses this whole body of students, parents, teachers, and, and takes them along to run a school well, where uh, students uh, are far beyond the level at which they came. And that is why if we take 100%, we jolly will make them 200%. Otherwise, we are not a success. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for that wonderful bit. Uh, I think you walked us beautifully through how a school can affect a person's development in their early years. Dr. Pai, if I may come to you next, sir. Uh, the same question, what to you are the measures of success? Good evening uh, to all and thank you for the wonderful platform. So uh, if you see the secret of any successful school, uh, we can see a strong leadership behind that. And uh, open communication and they, uh, they value their employees, these, that, and they communicate their values, goals, mission, and clearly. So this is the secret of a successful school. There may be some more points or any number of points. Uh, as uh, Aradhana ma'am rightly said that. Uh, now, if you see the parameter of a successful, I mean, to success the, I mean, to assess the successful school, there are a number of uh, parameters. So let us see one, one, four or five parameters now, according to my uh, the knowledge, the student achievement is the first and foremost uh, parameters. Here, uh, it doesn't mean that student achievement is, doesn't mean that only academic. What I mean to say is all round achievement of a student. So in a successful school, we can see uh, the ratio of all round achievement will be high. And at the same time, the students will be highly motivated. And of course, they are the good ambassador of the school. So if you see the second one, the discipline reference. As uh, Mr. Philip, Philip, I believe, if I am not wrong, uh, said, uh, said beautifully that two kids, uh, their behavior and other, uh, the way they interact with a guest 
so they are very much attracted towards that so uh, this is what i uh, refer discipline here so if we if we enter the successful school as soon as we enter we can see disciplined students teachers and totally disciplined environment and everyone in this campus have clear or clarity of the goal and vision and mission of the school so discipline in the sense not only it's like a military rule and all discipline here what i want to say is as philip sir said the way they behave with the guest way they behave with the parents way they behave with the uh, people in a public everything matters so uh, the next point is attendant attendance rates if we see the successful school attendance ratio will be high in successful schools students are highly motivated this is the main reason uh, we can see their uh, attendance ratio and uh, uh, absent ratio will be too less there and uh, so that what we can do is so that we will get a chance to teach them and chance to a uh, teach a student because they are in the school so ultimately this attendance rate is interlinked with students achievement also again i am telling students achievement in the sense all round development scholastically and co scholastically the next point or next parameter is graduation rate and if you get this right students and parents see your campus as a place where students receive the skills they need for success in post secondary education and most importantly their future careers so graduation rate is also a parameter for me and next is teachers satisfaction in an institution if you get this right your teachers are excited about opportunity to help students succeed they see possibilities rather than problems and uh, uh, they, they they are willing to do or they willing to go the extra miles to innovate and take instruction beyond the classroom also if you get this wrong surely recruiting an excellent teacher is like a pulling a teeth so your teacher retention rate also decreases so so for my this thing these are the important parameters to uh, assess a successful school so thank you thank you for the platform thank you sir thank you so much for sharing that with us uh, another ma'am if i may come back to you uh, the thing is we have discussed about holistic development we are talking about making better human beings we are talking about making them more inclusive but the sad fact is you look at the advertisements of schools during the admission season and you would see all india ranks 1 2 3 4 you would see how many 99% in the board exams with the uh, nep now focusing more on holistic uh, report cards and overall development even in vocational and skills training do you think this advertising advertising phenomenon will change in the years to come i guess uh, definitely and it's high time it changed because uh, you know uh, what they're doing is i get very concerned about this uh, you know uh, trend that is set in because this is again focusing on the success of an individual in getting into iit or you know one of these premier uh, institutions how tragic can it be because are we producing you know wholesome adults and the see the kind of uh, Uh, you know, atmosphere they give in these academies. The hundred students and you know, all cooped up in one room. One person comes, fantastic teacher, but travels all the way from a good metro city in a taxi. Comes, you know, teaches for eight hours and then goes away. You know, what sort of education is this? It really concerns. that uh, you know we are uh, going through this education system thankfully hopefully the mp will uh, negate all these kind of uh, things with no board exams but again they have to look at the um, uh, evaluation system and they have to look at the assessment system they have to look at the admission process in the universities if if it continues to be the same children will leave after the, after eighth rather than you know 12th 10th so uh, i mean this is something 
which is very serious and the board has to do something about it. Either they abolish, you know, 10, 11, 12 in schools and uh, just have these institutions. But if they want schools to run and schools to run successfully in imparting education, they've got to do something about this kind of trend that is set in. Because uh, schools become, uh, you know, the kind of dummy schools where either you, uh, children don't attend and they go into these academies. Why aren't we attracting the best uh, talent into uh, schools? Because uh, they're all going into academies on lesser, you know, working hours. Uh, you know, very few teachers are now willing to come to school for 11th and 12th in spite of the uh, high pay scales because there's a lot of responsibility. So these kind of things you have to improve. And uh, uh, these kind of rankings, this kind of, uh, you know, aura attached with the uh, rankings, this, this has to, uh, you know, come down eventually. And do they uh, contribute to the success of schools? Depends on, again, what you see a successful school uh, like. If you if you think that on my board there should be you know five children showing uh, with, with five photographs who have got through J mains and my school is successful, well, so be it. It depends what you want. But if you think that the, uh, that uh, you see the school group as such stand out in a social environment where they are contributive members of society then it does not matter at all. And again, like, um, I think Mr. Phillips said in the beginning, it is not about, you know, um, if you go through Bill Gates or Ellen Mather, if you go through their biographies, uh, they were not uh, uh, top students. They discovered themselves much later. And so what? I mean, sometimes, um, uh, uh, like Mr. Bhattacharya said, it's very alarming that 27% uh, people only do what they're trained for. I basically am not doing what I was, what I was trained for. But so what? I'm doing something else in another uh, sphere. And uh, I made a success of, of it. It's OK. So uh, you know, probably you find much later what you are good at, what is your calling. And that is what the NEP is doing now. It's uh, laying out this uh, wide kind of platform for you to choose. In our times, we chose in, you know, in my times, we chose our subjects in the ninth standard. So in the, in the ninth standard, which child knows whether he wants to take science, arts, or, you know, home science or commerce, who knows? So we, we decided our fate in, in class nine. Today, they're deciding the fate, uh, fate in class 10. So that's not fair. So now when a child takes a variety of subjects and he can choose what he studies, it is going to be much, much better to find his uh, calling. The other day I was reading um, one of the biographies, I'm forgetting at, at the moment which one. It's, it's one of these uh, Bill Gates, no, not Bill Gates. Anyway, so, you know, he uh, left uh, uh, college, dropped out from college, and he, mm, yes, uh, this, a font he discovered. So he went to college and he took up a calligraphy lesson. And that was the, the base on which he, uh, he made these fonts, which we all use. So you see, he discovered it in college. But so what? So this kind of open education system where we're told to think, where children are taught to be creative. So these kind of terms which have now come in, creative thinking, design thinking, uh, flip learning, you know, these are the boons of education system. And this will create thinking adults. These will not create these boat learners who are trying to get in, you know, crack these exams. And after all, tell me, when a child goes into IIT, when a student goes into IIT, is he required to know all these formulas and pass that to become a good engineer? You know, as you uh, as you become an adult, you grasp much faster. He can learn all this in the IIT. So what you need is a wholesome human being. Why are so many suicides in IIT? I mean, we need to think about it. We need to develop in, in school, especially. We need to develop wholesome personalities. We need to develop well-balanced adults who will care for their environment, their uh, social well-being, who will have the emotional intelligence more than, uh, you know, academic intelligence. And as he goes along, he will find his way. People who are academically inclined will find their way. The kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, teaching methods which are coming in into the NEP will help us, you know, uh, now develop uh, these children into adults who think, who innovate, who experiment. Otherwise, where was the time in the uh, uh, you know, system for students to even innovate. Practical exams was such a sham. 
Now it is project-based learning. It is integration of subjects. So uh, I am very, very hopeful in this whole area of uh, this pandemic has given me such new hope that eventually, even though it took us a pandemic to do that, but eventually we're going to improve the system. And we are, you know, uh, if you see 10 years down the line, we'll be much, much better off than we would have been if the pandemic had not come into our lives. Wonderful, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Pai. On that hopeful note, sir, how do you see schools advertising themselves? Do you really feel that uh, development of all-rounded individuals, holistic learning would actually feature in ads? Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I didn't get you. Sorry, sir. So I was asking, given this knowledge that uh, ma'am just spoke about, that we will focus on all-round development, on building holistic individuals. Do you see in the recent future, in the next five to 10 years, school advertisements talking about holistic development and upstanding individuals? Yeah, actually, sir, it's a high time to change all this advertisement and other things. Uh, actually, school should refrain from these kinds of advertisement. School should publishing, I mean, uh, school should stop this uh, publishing students' names and photographs and banners or as media advertisement. What I mean, so, so that students have less stress. They can focus on their skill. And we can promote healthy competition in our school also. So I strongly believe that all these kind of advertisement should be refrained. And that's what NEP it supports. So I highly support and highly believe in this NEP. Uh, this is the main reason where in NEP all the children can get good education in their uh, level or in their whatever area they are interested. Uh, so this is what NEP contains. So sir, I should strongly say that uh, all schools should refrain all this, these things, advertisement. Wonderful, That's sir. sir. Uh, so, Preeti, ma'am, we sir. have an agreement between Aradhana, ma'am, and Dr. Pai that schools should not advertise academic achievements. But, ma'am, here's the thing. How would the parents take to it? Because at the end of the day, the parents are one generation older. They are perhaps looking at employability as the outcome of education. How do you think I... parents will react to it? Right. It is uh, what both the panel said. I too say the same thing because advertisement in the other way we can say jo dikta hai, wo bikta hai. But education is a thing that is dikhane ki cheez nahi hai. Wo hume build up. I, we have to build that thing up within the students. Then only we can, we our advertisement will be that itself. We don't have to uh, brand, brand anything. Education is not a brand. It is something we have to teach particular generations after generation so that when they grow up can face their life more sportly than what we are doing it today. Me, I'm not saying that our education was wrong. Not at all. That is not my motto of telling. But yes, we have to teach the students. Why are we fighting within our school that we have to be A grade, A grade, A grade? Why, when everyone will be A grade, who will be B grade? My question is that. Why B grade cannot be better than A grade? Many points it can be. Yes, many points it cannot be either. But many points, or I can say more than 80% B grades may be better than A grade. We don't have to show off. Education is nothing to be show off. What happens, this burden goes to the students, to the parents, to the parents' pocket. All these burdens go there itself only. But what we have to do, our motto as an educator, educationist, we believe that we have to bring each and every student away from that tallying each other. It happens when there are two sons in a school, in a house, rather, mother, do not say ye beta bariya hai ya ye beta bariya hai. Ma ke liye, dono beta bariya hai. The same thing which we have, we should feel in the school also. Every student are good. Every student are equally powerful. Every student have their own capacity. That is all that I believe. 
so the new policy which we are going on is the best i think after many many years it has changed we have to follow we should follow follow it rather because it is a betterment of the school this uh, 2020 match or 2020 biscuit has taught us too many things we have learned many things from 2020 and we should remember it as a we say na that raat hoti hai tabhi subah hota hai to pandemic nahi aaya hota if pandemic wouldn't have been there maybe we we as education wouldn't have grown so much in these two years we have also grown and we should keep growing that is what i want to say thank you thank you so much ma'am uh, unfortunately we have run out of time but uh, i take this opportunity to thank all of you for making the time to be here today it's been a fantastic discussion uh, but it's a first of all thank you so much for the wonderful start that you gave to all of us uh, i think it just set the tone you gave us a wonderful list of activities and particularly i think your example of two students who were polite articulate smart and took your guests around the school well stuck with all of our panelists because that is an example that we kept coming back to thank you so much for the brilliant start that you gave to us uh, priti ma'am thank you so much for being here today i think your take on how schools should be more inclusive how they should cut across various layers of the society and how they should focus on creating bright upstanding individuals i think is a point that everybody on this platform has taken very well uh, aradhana ma'am thank you so much i think uh, you made some very very valid points uh, particularly the thing that you said ma'am about the nep being implemented uh, just to give you some sense ma'am this together for education platform we started in 2020 this is the 157th episode and in a way we are thankful to the pandemic that it gave us a chance to bring together over a lakh teachers who kind of contributed to this platform in uh, this thought exchange exercise and uh, one of the things that came out from many many discussions as that the nep more than in letter if it is implemented in spirit is going to be a huge game changer for school education in India. Thank you so much for being here today, ma'am. Dr. Pai, sir, thank you so much for enumerating those very important qualities. Uh, clearly a very uh, numerical quantitative approach to what could clearly define what a school success. Particularly, sir, the various rates that you spoke about, the attendance rate bit is a great point because a school is truly successful when students feel the need to be in class rather than come away from it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. To members in the audience, thank you so much for being here. It's been an absolute privilege playing host to you. Once again, my apologies for my bad internet connection today. We hope to rectify it in the days to come. We hope to see you soon in our next episode. Until then, please take care, stay safe, and goodbye. Thank you so much, Bayu.